They are in listen only mode. Hello and welcome to today's WCET webcast. We will go ahead and get started. We have a lot to go through today. Today's webinar is Acknowledging Knowledge Outside of the Classroom, a look at two approaches. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the Assistant Director for Programs and Sponsorship here at WCET. And we'll jump right into this webinar. First, we'll do introductions of our moderator and of our presenters. We'll go through University of South Carolina's Beyond the Classroom Matters initiative, then move to University of California San Diego's suite of engaged learning tools. We'll have a moderated discussion and then we'll get to your questions. As we go through, if you have any questions at all, please enter them into the question box and we'll be sure to get to those. Today we have a wonderful moderator. William Preston Davis is on our steering committee. He's also the Director of Instructional Services for Northern Virginia Community College. At this time, I'd like to hand it over to Preston. Great, thank you very much, Megan. I am very delighted uh, to be moderating this session and I am very interested to hear uh, what our presenters have to say. Um, and I also look forward to questions from the greater audience as well. Uh, so I would like to begin by uh, introducing our presenters. Uh, we have Bob Askins and uh, Pam Bowers from the University of South Carolina. Uh, we also have joining us uh, Kim Elias from the University of California at San Diego. And I would like to uh, ask them to just take a moment to introduce themselves to the audience. Hi, this is Bob Askins. I'm the Senior Associate Registrar at the University of South Carolina and co-sponsor of the Beyond the Classroom Matters initiative. Um, I've been working as a registrar for um, over two decades, in, primarily in uh, project management on IT-related projects, and have been working um, on this particular initiative for the past three years. Hi, I'm Pam Bowers. I'm Associate Vice President for Planning, Assessment, and Innovation in the Division of Student Affairs and Academic Support at the University of South Carolina. I'm in my ninth year here and I've worked uh, in academic and student affairs assessment for many years and have been focused on this project that we're going to talk with you about today for several years, uh, five or six years. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Kim Elias, the Engaged Learning Tools Coordinator at UC San Diego. I've been here a year uh, rolling out the Engaged Learning Tools, which includes the co-curricular record. Previously, I coordinated and implemented the co-curricular record at the University of Toronto, did my master's research on if employers would look at the CCR, and helped launch a CCR professionals network in Canada that now has 180 professionals from 80 institutions. Excellent. Thank you so much. And so we will begin uh, with the uh, project at the University of South Carolina. Great. I'm going to get started. Again, this is Pam Bowers. Uh, we're glad to be here with you all today. As I said, my role at the University of South Carolina is to lead assessment efforts for the Division of Student Affairs and Academic Support with the usual assessment goals of achieving continuous data-driven improvement and providing evidence of the impact of support and enrichment programs on student success. So the project we're going to talk with you about today, Beyond the Classroom Matters, is intended to help us achieve these things. The numbers that you see on the slide there refer to the Columbia campus in the University of South Carolina system, which is where Bob and I are located. Uh, on the next slide, the Beyond the Classroom Matters uh, is a system for incorporating records of student involvement in support and enrichment programs and institutional data, again, for the purposes of continuous improvement and providing transparency and accountability. And BTCM, for short, is uh, based on the idea that student learning and success in college is often affected by what students do outside the classroom as well as, well as what they do inside. So outside as well, how they engage with campus resources. Uh, lots of studies have been conducted to improve our understanding of the impact of student engagement. And research does seem to indicate that, uh, that engagement uh, can make a difference for student success. So Beyond the Classroom Matters provides a means for us to engage and test these theories at scale. 
at, uh, on our campus to determine how engagement matters for student success on our own campus. As many colleges and universities do, uh, uh, next slide, we invest significant resources in providing a rich learning environment that includes programs to support each student's unique circumstances and programs to enrich each student's educational experience. These uh, programs sh names shown up on the screen are examples of educationally purposeful programs and services uh, provided by the Division of Student Affairs and Academic Support. As the cost of attendance has increased, we've recognized that we uh, have got to do a better job of demonstrating the return on investment to the institution for providing these uh, usually non-credit programs and return on investment to the student for engaging in these programs. And we also need, uh, felt the need to improve our ability to determine how these programs contribute to student success, to better understand what works and for which students. So our strategy with this is to create a more comprehensive student educational record. Uh, next, we are doing this by first cataloging key support and enrichment programs. This is a screenshot of the Beyond the Classroom Matters catalog. And each uh, a catalog entry is created for each program that we want to include in the system. And each in entry includes some open text uh, descriptive elements and several elements that include choosing a defining value from a list of predefined choices. And as I think you can see there, the catalog is sortable by category and searchable by term and keyword. So the next slide shows part of, <coughs> excuse me, shows part of a catalog entry for uh, undergraduate research. Each word in a red font is defined so the user of the catalog can click on the red word and a text box will open up showing that definition. So each element of the framework, you know, those items in the left column is defined and many of the value entries in the right column, which describe a specific program, are also defined. And the next slide shows the definition of one, or part of the definition of one of the catalog entry elements for undergraduate research. When students engage in undergraduate research, they apply and practice inquiry and analysis skills. So that's what we're talking about when that is, shown, is selected as the defining value for that that element in the description. This definition is from one of the AAC and U value rubrics. So with this catalog, we're making the educational purpose and the structure of delivery for each program visible, describing how we engage students to achieve the purpose, uh, similar to how a course syllabus describes the intended learning outcomes for a course and the activities students engage in in the course to achieve those outcomes. Uh, next, we used many of these characteristics of high impact practices to create a framework for our catalog descriptions. So when defining programs, uh, departments are asked to provide descriptive information that illustrates how their activity aligns with these characteristics of high impact practices. For example, what are expectations for student involvement? How are those expectations communicated to students? How and from whom do students receive feedback on their involvement? To respond to each question or element that contributes to a catalog description, departments choose from data values that incorporate language from the CAS standards, from AAC and U's essential learning outcomes and value rubrics, and from NACE, the National Association of Colleges and Employers, from their identification of skills that employers value in new college graduates. Uh, next, we then uh, systematically record each student's completion of a cataloged program. As illustrated in this slide, uh, the department can enter student records individually or they can enter a group of records by uploading a file that contains uh, multiple student records. And it's important to note that students do not enter their own records into the system. So uh, next slide, to summarize, each program provider the Undergraduate Research Office, for example, uh, develops a catalog entry to define what constitutes expected engagement in the program or activity. The department then submits records of students who completed the cataloged program, and these records are then interfaced with student academic and demographic records and managed in our data warehouse. 
and we consider these to be official student records. And talking about official student records seems to be the perfect time to turn the discussion over to Bob Askins. Hello again. Um, yes, as, as Pam mentioned, uh, she um, came to the registrar's office a few years ago um, saying that she wanted to make these official human uh, official student records, which was something that a uh, registrar could really wrap his arms around. Um, from, from the perspective of the registrar, um, the critical components for establishing official records are data integrity and reliability. Um, what this means is that the data must originate from a trusted source, uh, so we uh, um, decided that we would not have any self-reported student data uh, in this system. It also um, means that the data must be collected and maintained in a secure manner and the chain of custody must be verifiable. Um, and you've seen a little bit of, of the uh, system we put in place to accomplish that. We um, did not feel that we could meet all the objectives of this project with um, our existing uh, student information system at the time or with the vendor products that we um, we reviewed when we were at this point. So um, we um, worked with our central IT partners to build a web-based system which was uh, built on a MySQL database backend and written primarily in um, PHP using JavaScript and jQuery to handle client-side uh, scripting. Um, we built an interface for administrators and program providers, um, which um, you saw some examples of, and then uh, have also built out um, views of individual participant records for students. You uh, a shot of the engagement description catalog and the student record creation process, which are currently in use. Um, what I would like to do in the next slide is show you a little bit of the, what the student would experience. What you see here is um, a system that has been developed but not yet um, launched uh, to, um, to students. But this is a student view um, which will allow each individual student to see their own records of campus involvement and allow them to reflect on all aspects of their, their college experience. We decided to keep this separate from our academic record for the time being. Um, but you'll, if you'll uh, notice on the entry on the left, this is an example student, Garnet Ann Black. Um, each student would have the um, opportunity to view their record in its entirety with all of the, the activities and engagements um, they've had or look at them by term. They can also look at them by category description such as CAS label or knowledge and skills applied. Um, the advisor, the student's advisor will also have access to um, this information so that they can use, um, use this to better advise students and um, recommend opportunities that they may want to explore. If we look at the next slide, we can show you um, the process by which a student manages this effort. What we, um, as I mentioned, we decided to keep this separate from the academic transcript. We wanted this to be optional for students, but also customizable. What you'll see in the left on the in the left image is um, essentially the student view of their individual activity record um, with radio buttons, so that uh, students can pick and choose which um, experiential learning um, activities they would like to present to a particular audience, um, and then they can save um, different versions of this um, activity or they can generate a uh, complete record of all of their experiential learning. We, um, we hope that um, by giving students this capability that they will um, become a little more thoughtful and intentional about some of these activities and it will allow them to um, more effectively communicate to prospective employers or grad school admission committees, what they know and what they can do as a result of their whole college experience. Um, in discussions with the employer advisory group that works with our career center, 
uh, we were told uh, by that group that they thought the most valuable thing about this system may be the language used in this um, in these catalog descriptions to describe the knowledge and skills that students have had an opportunity to apply in practice. They felt that um, this may help students recognize what they learned from their involvement and help them articulate how this learning is transferable to employment or, or other situations. In the next slide, um, you can see a, an example of our experiential learning record. This, um, if you'll notice, uh, it's a little faint, but it includes the official seal of the university and the signature of the registrar, which um, served to indicate that these are official university records. Um, one of our colleagues, uh, Dr. Amber Faluka, uh, conducted some student focus groups um, early in this process and, and discovered that students really value that these are uh, official documents, they appreciate these um, official indicators. They also like the fact that we were um, we were recording this information and that it was um, uh, managed and maintained by the university rather than being uh, student initiated. They thought that added a little extra validity to it. Um, Currently, uh, students are able to, will, will be able to share this document in PDF format, and because it's an electronic document, the recipient will be able to drill down to get additional information, um, go back to the full catalog description of the activity so that they could uh, get more detail about what these individual experiences entail. Um, we are um, also uh, beginning to explore other ways of uh, sharing and presenting these data. I'm going to turn it back over to Pam now, and in the next slide she'll show you uh, a little bit of what we're doing with a dashboard report. Pam? Thanks, Bob. So uh, Bob talked a bit about how we are able to share these records back with individual students, share their own records, and I'm going to talk a bit more about how then we're able to share the records or the data with, for institutional purposes. Now we developed the dashboard report that you're seeing on the screen uh, in part so that program providers and faculty could see which student populations are participating in which programs, and equally important, which populations are not participating. So this screenshot shows an example in which we have used the filters up at the top of the dashboard. It's kind of hard to see that uh, they're so small, but there's filters up at the top part of the dashboard, and we have selected those in order to show characteristics of students who completed a semester of undergraduate research in summer 2016 on the Columbia campus. So uh, to further clarify here, you can see, again, this is tiny, but in the upper left-hand corner, at the time we created this uh, screenshot, we had 35,000 plus student records in the system. And again, we are uh, currently uh, continuing the process of building out the catalog and the student records repository. The charts at the bottom of the dashboard show the breakout of participant characteristics for those filters I mentioned for undergrad research in summer 2016 Columbia campus. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, the charts down at the bottom show the breakout of participants by classification, by cumulative GPA, by state of residence, by uh, race, ethnicity, and gender. And we're working on additional dash dashboards with filters for other student characteristics uh, like first generation status or Pell Grant eligibility. And our data analysts will be able to download the data set from our data warehouse to study relationships among student participation in specific programs or patterns of programs and institutional outcomes, you know, what we measure at the institutional level things like retention, uh, graduation rates, employment, grad school admission, those kinds of things. We've not yet conducted uh, many studies using the BTCM data. Our focus has been on building the system. But we have found that uh, just being able to see the student involvement in this dashboard is already causing programs to think about the extent to which they are reaching their target populations and kind of the implications of that. Uh, so next, we think this uh, system this data set. On the next slide, this is illustrated. We, we believe this data set will make it possible for us to better understand the whole college experience. 
enabling better analysis of what works and for which students. We know that students drop out or slow down or, on the other hand, um, thrive for lots of reasons which may or may not center around academics. So BTCM is providing a means for us to see the whole system that's producing our current student outcomes and we plan to use that information to improve specific programs and the range of program offerings accordingly. Uh, next, we wanted to talk just a bit about uh, lessons learned from this uh, project. Uh, on, we, we thought early on it seemed like this was primarily a tech technology project. We knew we needed a way to record student attendance and participation which hadn't been done in a systematic way, and we felt like that was the biggest challenge. But we learned that it kind of turns out that, the defi that defining the programs to be tracked and uh, collected was actually more of a challenge. Because these programs usually don't produce uh, credit hours or grades, they often have not been systematically defined in terms of educational purpose, content, delivery structure. They have educational or developmental intentions, but have not stated those in a catalog or a syllabus. So moving to one system for capturing that information required lots of, continues to require lots of conversations and support building. And it required developing a shared terminology. We all know what a course is or what a degree program is. Those terms already have shared meaning across the university. But we discovered that we use imprecise language to describe these non-credit programs. A student activity might be called the same thing, but defined very differently depending on the department engaging the student. For example, we found that we didn't really have a standard definition of what constitutes undergraduate research uh, that occurs outside a course. You know, we didn't have that clearly defined in terms of what's required, what's optional, how much time on task is enough to qualify for an official record. Um, I mentioned earlier that we use the framework of high impact practices to, st to structure catalog entries. We don't mean to suggest that we think every program in the catalog is a high impact practice, but we're trying to determine which ones are on our campus. And we know that activities discussed in the literature are high impact practices. Uh, they, are, they only are that if they are delivered in certain ways. And we found that working through this defining process forces us to clarify and articulate both the educational purpose and our intentions for how we will engage students to achieve the purpose. So working through this has led to several improvements in our programs as staff have had to carefully think through their intentions and program delivery plans. So uh, finally, although it's not primarily a technology project, technology is critical to making it work, which seems to be true for about everything we do, but it is true in this case for sure. Uh, this system does require an in interface with our existing student information system, which turns out to be a pretty big effort. Uh, and since these records have been kept by individual departments rather than in a university system, over time many, many independent systems have evolved across our student affairs unit. So this requires connecting, resolving multiple record keeping systems and related issues. So uh, finally, this uh, uh, on the last slide, this new comprehensive student record links each student's educational experiences, whether these are for academic credit or not, providing the institution with a much better understanding of each student's holistic college experience and better data to the institution for determining how non-credit programs correlate with retention, graduation, employability. And we believe that making these comprehensive records available to students can enhance their educational experience and, as Bob said, help them demonstrate what they know and can do as a result of their whole college experience. Thank you. Uh, I will turn it back to other presenters now. Thank you. Thank you both very much. I know that we're going to have a couple of questions for you uh, in a few moments, and I would encourage uh, the audience to submit questions in the chat window as well. Um, but now I'd like to uh, turn it over to uh, Kim. Awesome. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, so next slide. I wanted to start off with a poll um, to get a sense of what you feel has the least significant influence on an employer's decision over hiring one candidate over another. Um, so this comes from NACE, the National Association of Colleges and Employers Job Outlook Survey. Uh, so I think you have a moment where you can all vote and then we'll reveal what the answer is. 
So least significant influence on employer's decision to hire one candidate over another. We're at about 64% participation. Let's see if we can get that up to maybe 85, 90%. Just give for it a those few, that it, yes, yeah. few more. For seconds. those of you who have voted, I also just want you to take a moment to think about why you selected that and why you think that has the least significant influence. Normally, when this is in person, I get people to talk in pairs, and then we talk in a large group. And there's our answer. So, least significant influence has been involved in extracurricular activities. So, believe it or not, but actually, the least significant significant influence is high GPA 3.0 or above. And actually, if you look at this list, in this survey, major was number one, followed by has held a leadership role, followed by involved in extracurricular activities, and then GPA. And so part of this is because these are indicators that help employers understand what are the skills and competencies that stu students have when they're applying for jobs. So a major, a student may be an English major, and there are certain assumptions that come with that in terms of the skills that they're bringing to a position. So similarly, if a student is a computer science major or an engineering major, again, there are certain assumptions about what skills have been developed, not necessarily that they need that particular major for that position. High GPA 3.0 or above, a lot of the literature says that if, well, first off, many employers don't ask for GPA, and then if they do, they'll often look at, as long as students have a 3.0, then we'll look at these candidates. Because comparing, you know, a 3.3 from one institution to a 3.0 from another can be quite difficult, and so GPA doesn't often have a, a major influence in making that decision. If you go to the next slide. So, What's interesting, though, is that being said, students care more about GPA than learning. So what we want is students to come in and be excited about learning and developing skills and the whole educational experience. But what we have is, and this happened with myself as well, the stress and focus on how can I get the best grade in this class. Next slide. And we wonder why this is the case, but part of it is because what we highlight is what gets valued. So oftentimes, that one credential or piece of paper that we're giving students highlights the class and the great achievement that they got. It's not highlighting these are the different skills and competencies that you learned inside and outside the classroom. So you ask the student what their GPA is, chances are they can tell you. If you ask them, what skills did you learn in your political science class? oftentimes you'll get blank stares. So at UC San Diego, what we wanted to do is better reflect what we value so that students have an understanding that when you're here on campus that you are getting more than a grade and you are more than a number, but that you are developing these skills inside and outside the classroom. So next slide. So how did we get here? Um, in 2012, two major initiatives happened that kind of came together. Number one was this education initiative led by uh, the EBC, Exec Executive uh, Vice Chancellor, who had a call to faculty, uh, put out a challenge on how can we impact uh, student learning uh, and the student experience. And at the same time, we also had a new chancellor who engaged in the campus's first strategic planning process. Those two kind of then came together and uh, led to a series of committees, which then ended up putting forth a recommendation to create the Teaching and Learning Commons where my position is housed. And the Teaching and Learning Commons is meant to be this kind of system level structure that is helping faculty uh, be better teachers and have more engaged learning in their classrooms, but then also bringing in academic support services and experiential learning opportunities. We then started to look at what do we have on campus and what do we want to further develop on campus to, again, better reflect what we value and help students better uh, articulate the skills that they've developed. So we engaged in this collaborative effort 
and a partnership initiative between the Commons, the Registrar's Office, and Career Services to launch the Engaged Learning Tools. Next slide. So we really wanted to focus not just on the transcript, but creating a suite of tools to help students discover opportunities on campus, capture those experiences through official records, and then use them as pedagogical tools to help students reflect on and articulate um, their whole experience. Next slide. Now, I can talk about each of these four tools for an hour and a half, um, so I'm going to give a very high-level overview of them. We do have more information on our website, ELT, so Engaged Learning Tools, elt.ecsd.edu. But the first one is the REAL portal, and REAL stands for Research Experience Applied Learning. So a lot of um, students have talked about, we want a way to find research opportunities on campus. Uh, because sometimes they're not posted or we don't know how to go about it. And so a few years back, the university created uh, an undergraduate research portal to help students find research opportunities and to help faculty find students for research opportunities. We then, through that whole uh, education initiative and strategic planning process, thought, we could expand the undergraduate research portal to include other things, including internship, global experiences, and service. So now we have this go-to portal where students can filter through opportunities both on and off campus, paid, unpaid, identify uh, what year they're in, um, and be really intentional about what kinds of opportunities they want to engage in. And then I mentioned there's also the other side where a faculty member let's say an English faculty member is looking for a computer science student and can filter through brief student profiles to find students and suggest that they apply for opportunities. So the real has become um, that kind of discover connecting students to opportunities option. The next tool is really our um, academic transcript. So we leveraged our academic history to have an enhanced electronic transcript, and we're working with uh, Parchment um, as the vendor. So when students request an electronic version of their transcript, they get a secure PDF with embedded hyperlinks. When they select the hyperlink, another page pops up with the course title and description, the instructor's name and contact information, and the grade distribution for the section. This is meant to help students keep track and, and remember what were those classes that they took and have more details, and different end users can also explore those. But there is also the potential to further enhance uh, the enhanced transcript, and we've already started early discussions about highlighting high-impact practices or different competencies and skills students are engaging and, and developing inside the classroom. So students can request just their transcript, or they can request their transcript with co-curricular record, which is the next tool. And next slide. Great. So the CCR, um, in many ways, has parallels to what we just heard um, from the University of South Carolina, where it captures opportunities beyond the classroom and the various competencies and skills that students are developing. Um, at UC San Diego, like I said, students can get just their transcript or transcript with co-curricular record in both an electronic or paper version, and that gets uh, included as one package. We have four categories, community-based global learning, professional career development, student engagement in campus life, research and academic life. All these opportunities um, do have certain criteria that they have to meet. They have to be attached to the institution, be able to be validated by a recognized university staff or faculty member, identify that it is active engagement, so students can't just sit there and listen, but that they're actively in developing these competencies and skills. And then for all categories, uh, we have a minimum 30-hour requirement, except for professional career development, because there were some workshop series that we felt should be included and didn't meet that. Um, we're using Orbis Communications, which is a, a Canadian system. Um, they've been doing co-curricular records since about 2006. Um, and students can also select it, what they want to highlight in each instance of their record. So if they want to hide certain opportunities because they're applying to one job and showcase it for another job, uh, they're able to do so and customize it. 
also signed by the registrar and not shown here, but what also comes with the CCR is uh, a guide that highlights our uh, criteria, the validation process, and a definition of the 12 competencies that we are leveraging. So next slide. A quick overview of the process. So I've been in this role for about a year. And in the last year, I've been going on what I call my roadshow. So going around campus, meeting with staff, faculty, and student leaders to identify what opportunities on campus exist that should be included. We then have a form that is filled out by those uh, primarily staff and faculty, but also some student leaders to identify what the opportunity is, uh, the description, what are the competencies, and how are students developing those competencies, and then what is required to have it validated. So they must meet, you know, um, attend at least 80% of executive meetings, and um, plan at least two events per quarter, submit a transition report, whatever those kind of key deliverables are. We then have a committee made up of staff, faculty, and students that meets monthly to review these opportunities. They may say, actually, we feel this competency is more relevant to this position, or we'd really like to see a reflective component included in this opportunity. So this is the, the feedback and review process uh, to uphold a certain level of standard for opportunities that are included. Once that opportunity is in the database, it then lives there. A staff faculty validator is assigned to it, and at the end of the quarter, they can just copy and paste the student IDs into the system and add it to their record. Next slide. So we uh, developed a competencies framework. Uh, these are the, the 12 that we have. And there are some other one or there are definitions that are associated with it. Um, each opportunity can have up to three of these competencies attached to it. Um, and again, those who are submitting have to identify how students will be developing those competencies. These come from multiple frameworks. So we looked at AACNU, at CAS, at our uh, WASC accreditation. And then there were a few that were developed here at UC San Diego that were important for us to have included. Next slide. And click again. So this is the whole package if a student requests a transcript with CCR. And we've created a very harsh line between the transcript captures opportunities for credit and the CCR captures opportunities that are not for credit. And then it's followed by the guide to the CCR and guide to the transcript. Next slide. So while the transcript and the CCR are the official records of the university um, and they serve a great purpose, it also is limited in what it captures. So we also created an electronic portfolio tool with Portfolium the vendor to help students bring their curricular and co-curricular learning to life. So this is where students can upload pictures, videos, artifacts, documents, have a description about what that experience was, tag it by skills they developed, teammates uh, that were involved in the project, and share this and connect with employers and um, other peers in their network. And alumni also have access to continue to use this once they graduate. And each student gets uh, a unique URL, so portfolium.com slash Kim, and that's something that they can then put on uh, their resume and, and, and share when they're applying for graduate and professional schools. So when we talk about this, we say, you know, you may have been recognized for your engineering class, but here you can showcase the robot that you built and what your process was and what you learned. Or maybe you organize a conference and were recognized for that on the CCR, but here you can showcase the conference agenda and send pictures and videos that showcase how the, the conference went and what you learned um, and some of those key deliverables. Next slide. So how we primarily talk about and utilize the tools is on the one hand as a reflective tool. So um, we do a lot of, I've done a lot of workshops with advisors, career and academic advisors on how to utilize the ELTs when talking with students. So we have a lot of students here who initially want to go to medical school and that 
aspiration may change for many reasons throughout their career. So saying, like, let's pull up your CCR, your portfolio. What kinds of things have you been involved in that you've enjoyed? Or what kind of skills have you developed? And how can we leverage that information to help you explore career or academic paths? We also encourage students to utilize these tools when they're writing their resume or cover letter, preparing for applications. Um, because while the tools themselves, I think, bring real value to employers at graduate schools, the main um, reason behind it, too, is that we want students to not only showcase these things, but be able to reflect on it and articulate the skills that they developed at their whole uh, UC San Diego experience. But then we also want students to share it when they're applying for graduate school and the job search process, for on-campus jobs, and for things like student leadership awards and being able to leverage uh, the CCR and portfolio in that process has great value. And I often say that you know the CCR, but all the tools, um, the, the piece of paper is the most and least important aspect of the program. Um, it, again, it's not just a matter of here's this piece of paper and that's it, but it's um, the university saying that this is important and that you should be engaged in these opportunities. And that's an important message for students and for parents and families and employers. Um, but that also, it is also meant to be that reflective pedagogical tool for students to also still uh, articulate their experience. Next slide. So just an example of one of the ways that we do this is uh, I facilitate a lot of workshops with students about how to translate the value of their experience and utilizing the, the tools in those sessions, but really getting students to think about, okay, in the class, here are some competencies and skills that we've identified. How have you developed those skills in the classroom? And then we also talk that, about that um, in terms of co-curricular opportunities and get them to practice translating the value of their experience. So that's the end of my slides, but um, just in summary, again, we want to highlight what we value, and the ELTs are meant to help students find opportunities, capture those on an official record, and then share those experiences and skills to uh, employers and graduate and professional schools. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I do hope that we will get some questions from uh, the audience, and, and uh, if we do have any uh, questions um, coming in, we will be certain to share those um, with our panelists. I actually do have a couple of questions uh, to begin with, and um, I'll uh, start uh, by asking uh, Kim, who, who just spoke, um, what has been some employer feedback um, about the co-curricular record? Yeah, um, so I had done my master's research on what employers look for when hiring and first noted that there were student development transcripts and co-curricular uh, transcripts back in the late 70s, early 80s in the US. And there was a study, uh, Brian Mann, Nelson, and North that asked employers if they would look at a CCR. Um, and seven out of 10 employers said that they would want or definitely want um, a CCR or CCT in the process. And in my survey with 110 employers from various industries, um, they all, 77% of employers said that they were very likely um, or likely to review a CCR in the application process. Um, but the number one thing that I kind of uh, found from my survey is that some employers understood the value of uh, co-curricular engagement, while many did not. And then I asked to what extent they felt students did a, a, a great job at articulating the value of their co-curricular experiences, and 4% said students do an excellent job. So my argument is, you know, a lot of students are involved in these great opportunities, but let's say if they're an RA and they've developed teamwork and communication leadership, but they can't translate the value of that experience to an employer effectively, and an employer doesn't know the value of an RA experience, then that value is lost in the process. And the assumption is the student doesn't have the skills and there's a job skills gap. So really what things like the CCR, and I think um, what Beyond the Classroom Matters can do is act as that translation tool 
to help students be able to articulate the value of those experiences, but also so employers start to see that institutions are placing value on these experiences and that if they know that it is about co-curricular experiences are valuable and do develop skills, whether they see the CCR or they see those experiences on a resume, the hope is that they're going to put more weight behind that. Excellent. Thank you. And um, a question that I actually will ask all, but we'll start with um, uh, Bob and Pam. Um, why did you decide to undertake this project in the first place? Uh, I'll, I'll take that one. This, um, I, I mentioned I'm the assessment person. This project really started out as a, about having a need for better data. And a, along the way to building better data, we realized that we could do lots of things once we had th these better data. So I've mentioned before that you know my, my responsibility is for planning and assessment across the Division of Student Affairs. So that's where this project originated in that office, and our Student Affairs Division is a big division with about 45 departments. And in part, it is such a large division because the University of South Carolina is really committed and has this as a stated goal to provide a superior student experience. So as a university, as an institution, we invest a lot of resources in providing this rich learning environment that, as I mentioned earlier, you know, includes programs to support each student's unique circumstances, you know, individual challenges that might come along, and provides programs for enrichment, you know, to add uh, extras to each student's educational experience. And as we all know, in higher education, there's a price tag attached to all these programs. And as the cost of university attendance has increased, we recognize that we really, you know, I said this earlier, that we really needed to do a better job of demonstrating the value these programs add. You know, why is they, uh, what is the difference and the return on investment uh, to the institution and to the student for this kind of environment provided at a, a uh, campus like the University of South Carolina? And as uh, stated before, you know, our student affairs and academic support programs all have educational and developmental purposes. And, uh, but these purposes and achievements are often not well known or well understood by non-student affairs people, by students or faculty or parents or other stakeholders. So we, uh, in our process of creating this uh, better data, these better data this, uh, through the systematic approach, this comprehensive student record, we feel like we're making this educational purpose more visible and we're making visible our intentions for how we engage students to achieve these purposes. As I said earlier, you know, similar to how a course syllabus describes the intended learning outcomes for a course and then what students do in the course, how they're engaged in order to achieve these outcomes. So by you know, going through this systematic process, we make things uh, visible, so clarify the educational purpose. And then we, by incorporating these more systematically defined and collected records, we then improve our ability to analyze program effectiveness and, and determine more specifically what contributes to student success on a specific campus. And we, we know from the research literature, uh, in general, what types of engagements have have demonstrated that they uh, contribute to student success, but it's hard to determine that on an individual campus. And again, as we talked about, in addition to that, it also, uh, and this wasn't really our original intention, but we realized along the way that we could do this, that we could uh, make it possible for each student to see their own records of campus involvement and give them the ability to reflect on their learning from all aspects of the college experience and perhaps make some more intentional choices about how to be involved to apply and practice knowledge and skills that, that might more closely align with their career plans and their life goals, that, those sorts of things. And then, uh, as Bob demonstrated, they can produce this university verified report of their involvement in these non-credit but educationally purposeful activities so that they can then better communicate that as an individual to prospective employers and grad school admission committees, those kinds of things, about what they've learned from their whole college experience. So, so our original purpose, I mean, and continues to be to achieve these assessment goals of improving programs and providing transparency and accountability and uh, 
and adding value both for the institution and for the students, we believe. So how about Kim, can you uh, just maybe elaborate a little bit on what sort of sparked this uh, at your institution? Yeah, so those conversations happened before I got here, but a large part of it was wanting to help students understand the value of the UCSC experience and the focus on learning, um, because I had mentioned a lot of it was, I need to get grades to get into medical school or whatever the next goal is. But we know that those programs are looking for well-rounded candidates and employers are looking for graduates with teamwork, communication, leadership, professionalism. So it was a way for us to, again, highlight what we value, um, but then also to create the means and tools to help students connect those opportunities and then showcase uh, those competencies and skills. And we are still early on in the process, but do want to do a lot of assessment around um, is there an impact in student understanding of the value of co-curricular experiences now that we've developed these tools? And as we have them for more and more years, um, the hope is that it'll shift the culture so that students understand that when they come here, we want them to be engaged inside and outside the classroom. And coming from the University of Toronto, which has now had a co-curricular record for four years, uh, we've seen that with each year, um, and now that the incoming class doesn't know a university experience without a CCR, that it does um, start to become embedded in the culture. Thank you. Um, and I, there's a question about, um, uh, for Bob and Pam, you'd mentioned that there were two uh, formats for the ELR that were available to students. Can you uh, just briefly uh, explain what each of those uh, formats are? Uh, take it away, Pam. Okay, I was uh, waiting for you. It's just two different ways of displaying the information. Uh, one is, I think, the example that, that uh, Bob talked about was showing the, the uh, students' records organized by category type of activity, like uh, undergraduate research was one category, and maybe student leadership roles is a, is a second category, and then underneath that heading showing the term in which the student engaged in that activity and any additional information collected about that activity. The other format frames it in terms of the knowledge and skills that students practice and apply that they're developing when they engage in a particular activity. So instead of the heading being undergraduate research, the heading might be, uh, would be uh, you know, inquiry and analysis. And then underneath that, it would say undergraduate research and the term. You know, so the same information, just packaged in a little different way. Okay, we have an uh, audience question about uh, when implementing these programs on your campus, how can other schools use these frameworks with limited resources available. Any thoughts on that? Well, I know ACRO, NASPA, and the Lumina Foundation um, have been engaging in the Comprehensive Student Record Project, which I believe um, University of South Carolina is part of, so you may want to talk more about it. But the goal is to develop 12 models of different variations of innovating credentials and having a comprehensive student record and that there would be certain tools and resources to help institutions understand how to implement that. Bob and Pam, I don't know if you have more to add about that initiative and how that can help. Yes, they well, I think, have. I, Go ahead. I'm sorry. You... I was just going to say that there is, um, we were part of that that um, Lumina project and um, and I think Kim described it very well. Um, there is also, as you're well aware, uh, a lot of discussion on the national level about this um, this area, and I think some of the um, some of the our corporate partners, some of the vendors in this um, in this space, are beginning to respond and um, and develop more uh, tools to assist uh, folks in um, in accomplishing um, some of these goals. Pam, what would you want to add? 
I was just going to say that uh, the uh, the Comprehensive Student Record Project that Kim mentioned was sponsored by and funded by the Lumina Foundation, and it was led by the Professional Associations, uh, NASPA for Higher Ed Student Affairs Professionals, and ACRO, which is the Association for Registrars and Admissions Officers. And if you so, if you look on the Lumina, if an institution is interested, they can learn a lot by going to the Lumina Foundation's website, the Comprehensive Student Record Project site within the Lumina Foundation site and find all the find a lot of information about what the 12 schools in that project are doing. Now, not all are working uh, in the same way that, that uh, Kim's institution or ours is, but there are 12 different ways of looking at this sort of thing and information about those. And both NASPA and ACRO have information about these things on their respective websites as well. And I, I guess I would just put one one more thought out there, and that was, as I mentioned in our in kind of our lessons learned summary, we really thought early on that that finding the right technology was the answer. You know that there was something out there that could help us do this, and it was the problem was finding the right thing. And technology is a big piece of this, but honestly, we have a, a big part of time spent on our campus is is the thinking things through process and the deciding and defining what activities we want to record. And it sounds like Kim's institution has put in a lot of time on this too, thinking very carefully about what should be included and how it's defined and how those records get added into the system. So I think starting down that path would be a good way to get started. Well, I think you guys have, have given us some, some really interesting information, and, and I'm sure that there's a lot of folks that are looking at ways to maybe uh, incorporate a uh, similar type of program at their institution. Uh, and one, one final question that I would just like to ask uh, both groups to, to very briefly uh, address is maybe uh, give us one or two major challenges that you may have faced when implementing this project at your institution. Kim, you want to start? Sure. So buy-in for the concept at the two institutions I've been at has been easier than I thought. No one can really say encouraging students to get involved is a bad thing, but it's the follow-through that is a challenge. So I often say that my job is getting hundreds of people who don't report to me to do extra work. And I've figured out how to make it as easy as possible, but it is still one extra thing that someone has to do. Um, so that's kind of been a big challenge is getting that follow through to enter opportunities to validate students. And again, I think it's the once more and more students start to buy into it and the culture shifts, then it kind of just becomes part of it. Um, but I would say that has been the biggest challenge. And the second one is it's amazing how quickly students learn about it but really understanding what it is and the value of it, that takes a little bit more time and work. And so um, doing a lot of workshops, having student ambassadors to, to maybe go out there and promote and talk about it is really needed um, because just having a poster, or having a link to it um, on a website isn't communicating the whole value of, of the program. Okay. I, I would um, just uh, echo what what Kim said that this that getting the follow through is a huge part there's lots of buy-in support people get it they understand and see the value in what we're trying to do but it takes lots of time and commitment to the process of thinking things through talking things through documenting things because it's all you know to provide this level of transparency requires clarity of purpose and intentionality in in program structure I mean outlining all that and putting it out there for the world to see so it takes a while to get there. Well, great. Thank you very much. Uh, I think this has been uh, an excellent topic to address, and I really appreciate the information that you've shared, and, and I'm very uh, happy to have been part of this. Uh, and finally, I would just like to turn it back over to uh, Megan for any uh, last words from WCET. Thank you very much. Thank you, Preston, for moderating, and thank you to our wonderful presenters today. Hopefully this was valuable information to you all, and we will send you the link to the recording. Make sure to share that with your colleagues. It's going to be 
uh, I think, more and more important to access this archive as, as we move on and this becomes something that more campuses are embracing. Stay connected with WCT. Our Leadership Summit is coming up June 14th through the 15th, and our annual meeting, which is open to members and non-members, will be in Denver, Colorado this year, October 25th through the 27th. All of the information about our events and programs can be accessed on our website. Thank you to our WCET supporting members and our annual sponsors that help underwrite much of our events and programs here at the organization. So we hope to see you on the next webcast in June, which has not been announced yet, but it will be a look at financial aid fraud. So stay tuned for more information. Again, thank you all for joining us and thank you to our presenters. Have a good day.